we are training the next generation to meet the strategic challenges of tomorrow. We are dedicated to understanding in order to act better. It is now time to move to, to our second panel of the day. This one on the challenges of intelligence sharing. The panel will be chaired by, by Arthur Wilsinski of the Communications and Security Establishment. Let me remind everyone that participants full bios are available on the program online. Arthur, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. The floor is yours. Uh, merci beaucoup, Justin. Uh, bonjour tout le monde, bon après-midi. Uh, mon nom est Arthur Wojcinski, je suis le sous-ministre associé, uh, sous-ministre adjoint associé auprès du Centre de la sécurité des télécommunications. Uh, je veux vraiment remercier UCAM ainsi que MINS pour l'honneur de participer dans ce panel. Uh, it really is an honor for me to participate. In addition to thanking UCAM and MINS, I'd also like to thank uh, the Network for uh, Strategic Analysis uh, for hosting this conference. I must say that as a, as a SIGINTER, uh, NSA means something a little different in, uh, in my universe, but I'm, I'm glad to make acquaintance with this particular version of the acronym. Um, while I'm joining you virtually, I am physically located on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence here dates uh, to time immemorial. I'd like to acknowledge their contributions and their ongoing contributions to this land. This afternoon's panel is of real interest to me. Uh, I think that already earlier this, this morning, and I think uh, my former boss, Daniel Jean, has already identified many challenges uh, associated with intelligence sharing. So I'm really in interested in hearing from some of our colleagues that are going to be speaking on this panel. Uh, as an intelligence practitioner, uh, a former Director General of Security and Intelligence at Canada's Foreign Ministry, the challenges of intelligence sharing are, are real, yet they are constantly evolving. Uh, we have three presentations for this panel, uh, each 10 minutes uh, long. First will be Adriana Siegel from Bellevue University. Second will be Saria Miriam Martin Brulé from Bishops University. And the third presentation will be by Stephanie Carvin from Carleton and Thomas Junot from the University of Ottawa. The subjects range from the global at UN level through the transatlantic to the national. And I'm really looking forward to the presentations and our discussions. I would like to remind uh, participants that if they have questions for uh, after the presentations are made, to please put them in the Q&A uh, uh, function in the Zoom webinar chat. So I would like now to invite Adriana Siegel to lead us off with a presentation on transatlantic intelligence sharing and cooperation challenges and opportunities. Over to you. Thank you very much, Arthur, for the nice introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have the opportunity to present here today. Um, first, I'd like to take a minute to thank the organizing committee for putting the event together, um, exemplary. Uh, and also uh, to all of you for taking time to be here today. Uh, my paper is about transatlantic um, intelligence sharing and cooperation, existing challenges and opportunities. And as some uh, of uh, our colleagues mentioned uh, this morning, I believe this is a timely topic, especially since the debate about the European Union suggests that the European Union is in a unique position globally to influence the world, uh, as well as the fact that the United States is back, uh, is back to rebalance uh, disputes in trade, address border sharing, uh, and show interest and support to European security. Uh, my presentation today will begin with an overview of existing challenges in transatlantic intelligence sharing, and then discuss prospective opportunities. So, what is intelligence sharing and how do we recognize it when we see it? Um, intelligence sharing is a form of international cooperation rooted in specific gains and common security interests. Of course, the definition is uh, evolving. Capturing intelligence sharing and especially transatlantic intelligence sharing in open sources can be quite challenging uh, because of the quantity and quality of information available. So 
uh, for the purpose of this paper, I explored areas uh, with constant flow of information and engagement between the United States and Europe. Uh, now, what do we know about past opportunities and obstacles in transatlantic intelligence sharing? Uh, the existing literature point to the fact, and it was uh, confirmed also today by one of the presenters, that 9-11, um, and especially the period after 9-11, is being considered one of the most beneficial in terms of information sharing initiation. This is a phase of transatlantic transformation and consolidation of partnership around common security interests. Transatlantic intelligence sharing occurred in areas dealing with global terrorism, transnational organized crime, and human trafficking. The partnership has been assessed by scholars as successful at sharing information that led to freezing assets, arrests, and financial interdictions. Through special arrangements, transatlantic partners shared information on airline passengers, shipping cargoes, and procedures for terrorist extradition. The most cited challenge, unfortunately, of this period is the difference in addressing terrorism as a criminal activity versus a military risk. Scholars also mention an increased reliance on bilateral versus multilateral intelligence sharing models. Uh, they find that uh, the United States, for example, preferred the bilateral model in the absence of a European joint intelligence system. And of course, for concerns related to source and uh, methods protection. Scholars also mentioned that there is also um, information uh, or asymmetric dependency on US technology and intelligence, inducing in this sense, in Europe, a sense of complacency and underinvestment in technology and innovation in models of intelligence sharing. European scholars, in fact, highlight that the existing EU intelligence system is highly fragmented by national interest, laws, levels of secrecy, oversight, accountability, and technical capabilities. Some things, of course, have improved in Europe uh, in the area of intelligence. However, I consider the fact that increased reliance on open source uh, information and nation states classified reports uh, can be quite challenges or challenging in terms of time uh, or timing that intelligence is needed to uh, make a decision. This information and the fact that inside the European Union, states may have different security and foreign policy interests. Mutual trust is also very important for intelligence sharing because trust drives sharing and improves security. Scholars mentioned that trust is discussed um, uh, or is more prevalent in, uh, in cases related to equality, fairness, and reliability. For example, the United States would prefer to have a more independent, reliable, a uh, stronger uh, European Union would like to see more cohesion inside the European Union. The European Union, uh, in contrast, would like to have um, from the US more assurances of loyalty uh, and acknowledge the European Union as an equal partner in the transatlantic uh, partnership. On the positive side, however, some argue that despite all the political turmoil and despite the deficiencies, uh, transatlantic intelligence sharing uh, is strong in the sense that threat assessments continue to be shared on issues related to terrorism, rogue states, and nuclear proliferation. And uh, 
uh, evidence behind this uh, is suggested that intelligence relationships usually have their own logic of cooperation. So in context of continuity and change, because here is what I am interested in, I'm looking more closely at the contemporary period, what specifically has changed in the partnership? So my findings indicate that the influence of the European Union in the partnership is growing. However, distinct interests have deepened and new challenges and new opportunities have been presented in global trade, privacy, technology, and geopolitics. New spaces for innovation in the architecture of intelligence sharing are possible. Intelligence now can be instrumentally utilized by both parties in the 21st century competition. So in international trade, a transatlantic intelligence sharing opportunity may be possible at the level of the European Commission in areas that defend the international system of rules based on trade. It may address China's trading practices and strengthen coordination on screening foreign investment. Data sharing is also one of the most cited challenges in the transatlantic intelligence sharing cooperation. The EU is against exporting uh, data on EU citizens without specific uh, legal commitments from the United States that data will be protected in the same way in the US as it is in Europe. So in this sense, parties can find uh, new ways to work together to secure legal commitments and reach agreements rooted in what they know best, human rights and democratic values. Unequal technological development is also a structural problem challenging the transatlantic partnerships, partnership on two levels. First, Europeans are behind the US and China in industrial digitalization and hope to restore technological sovereignty through tougher regulations on American companies. Using Chinese company, companies, for example, Huawei, uh, to build European digital infrastructure is something that does not set well with the United States. The United States perceives this to be a threat, uh, not only to uh, Europe, but also to the transatlantic intelligence sharing. So finding European opportunities to digitalize Europe is, a, is an impressive task that uh, the European Union should think about. Regional and global geopolitics affect the transatlantic partnership in the perception of common security interests and threats. China and Russia, for example, are replacing the terrorist uh, uh, threats in the United States and they are placed in the category of military threats. While in the European con context, perceptions differ over China, as a new source of investment versus a source of division and insecurity. Highly developed European countries view China, for example, as a strategic partner in climate change, and it should, competitor in economic development and strategic rival in human rights. Lastly, European strategic autonomy appears to be a sign of maturity decoupling desire to have more control over security and defense matter in Europe. And I believe that under proper guidance, Europe can take this step and see what they can achieve in the next 10 years. Lastly, um, a political scientist once said, the future is not some place we are going, but one we are creating. The paths are not to be found, but made. So as the EU is becoming more assertive of its role and interests in the partnership, the US can continue to provide leadership 
knowledge and support on how to strengthen multilateral institutions. The improvement of the transatlantic intelligence sharing and cooperation, of course, can begin in Europe through investment, innovation, and development of modern institutions and frameworks for intelligence collection, analysis, share, and sharing. Building a 21st century intelligence sharing infrastructure may prompt the United States to partner with Europeans on developing shared standards for surveillance technologies that will contain, hopefully, the digital authoritarian models threatening fair competition, privacy, and liberal democracy. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very, very much for that, uh, uh, Adriana. I think that that was a very interesting presentation and it builds nicely on uh, the conversation I think that we had earlier this morning in the session chaired by, uh, by Jill Sinclair. Uh, I think that there are a lot of, of issues that you identify, but I really like the, uh, the way that you wrapped it up towards the end in terms of something that we are creating and uh, uh, together. And I think that that's part of the conversation that I think is really important to have that while we identify uh, some challenges, that we actually do look at how do we maximize opportunities? How do we look at what we're building together in order to address the, the challenges that I, we've already started to hear a little bit about? And uh, as we're talking about uh, uh, those challenges, one of the things you spoke about was, was trust uh, also. And I think that that's also a, a thematic that is a good segue uh, into the presentation from our, our next uh, panelist, uh, Saria Miriam Martin Brulé will speak about that search uh, for trust, uh, challenges in UN peacekeeping intelligence. Uh, so over to you, Sarah Miriam. Thank you very much, Arthur, and thank you very much, Stein and Thomas, for organizing this 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 wonderful conference. Um, the UN peacekeeping intelligence policy is, is a stepping stone to more effective and safer peacekeeping missions. It fulfills a dire and long overlooked need to, li uh, to link enhanced situational awareness to timely decisions and actions to ensure the safety and security of personal and the protection of civilians. Developed in the wake of the Cruz Report in 2017 and the Action for Peacekeeping Initiative in 2018, it represents a paradigm shift from intelligence conceived as an inherently sovereign matter to a rigorous approach to gathering information and making forward-looking assessment in the UN context. The challenge of developing peacekeeping intelligence is how to do intelligence and how to get it right at the UN. If each member state has developed its own way to do intelligence and with its own technology, what should intelligence look like for an international organization which promotes transparency, impartiality, and efficiency, and how to develop the best practices and on which basis? The UN has always recognized its needs for intelligence. Both the first two UN Secretary General decried the organization's lack of knowledge, understanding, and anticipation of the environment. The term intelligence was first used in the context of the 1960s UN operations in the Congo with the creation of a military information branch. Yet intelligence remained in the military realm and, and was mostly the prerogative of specific national contingents with no integrated approach to intelligence gathering within missions. In the 1990s, the UN created intelligence-oriented offices, some of which were dismantled, due to the member state's suspicion that information collected could be used outside of UN missions. Yet tragedies in Rwanda and Srebrenica triggered new questions on the need for institutional mechanism to enhance situational awareness and provide early warning both in missions and at the UN headquarters. In 2003, the bombing of the UN offices in Baghdad confirmed that missions needed the capacity to conduct integrated analysis. A high profile attack against a UN base in the Democratic Republic of the Congo that killed several uniformed peacekeepers in 2017, together with the high casualty rate in MINUSMA, prompted the Secretary General to commission a report on the safety and security of UN peacekeepers. And the same year, the first UN peacekeeping intelligence policy was approved. In 2017, peacekeeping intelligence was defined as the non-clandestine acquisition and processing of information by a mission within a directed mission intelligence cycle to meet requirements for decision-making and to inform operations related to the safe and effective implementation of the Security Council mandate. 
through a consultative process, the UN Department of Peace Operations thus accomplish a tour de force in forging agreement among member states on the urgency and necessity of institutionalizing methods for intelligence while adhering to the UN principles of impartiality, transparency, and efficiency. In 2019, the policy was revised, rebranded as UN peacekeeping intelligence policy, but with a hyphen to emphasize the distinction with national intelligence and the UN specificity of such policy. Member states remain, however, hesitant to endorse the proposed definition and question how to limit the scope of using intelligence to inform operations relative to the peace operations mandate. Peacekeeping operations mandates are characterized by their comprehensiveness and refer to a wide spectrum of activities and tasks from stabilization to se sector security reform. For some member states, letting peacekeeping intelligence cover all aspects of the mandates would be too broad and could potentially lead to intelligence activity detrimental to their own interest. Making a point that after all, the term peacekeeping itself had never been officially defined by the UN, the member states agreed to remove the definition and in place of a definition, it included seven principles for peacekeeping intelligence. The US thus turned to the member states to provide the organization with best practices in the intelligence realm. Yet member states provided limited know-how for two main reasons. First, national intelligence systematically entails both clandestine practices and classified information, which are inherently not part of peacekeeping intelligence. And each state has its own way to do intelligence. Consequently, the UN has remained careful both to avoid adopting one member state way of doing intelligence over another, and not to use any tools, tactics, or procedures that would involve either clandestine practices or information that is classified at the national level. UN's effort to standardize peacekeeping intelligence method was concretized through the development of policy guidelines and handbooks. However, agreeing on the content of this uh, handbook among member states has been a challenge. As it is the case in national settings, in UN peacekeeping missions, information and analysis are to be shared on a need to know basis and in exceptional circumstances on a need to share one. Yet if intelligence is driven by a need to know basis, I highlight an additional need, the need to trust. Trust is key to intelligence sharing. The UN has faced challenges creating trust both between member states and units within the UN and within units in sharing information as to optimally implement the policy. The multinational composition of UN missions has long been identified as the main reasons for states' resistance to sharing intelligence in and with peacekeeping missions. The multinational composition of troops was associated with the fear of instrumentalization of intelligence in favor of domestic purposes at the expense of the peacekeeping's operation mandate. The peacekeeping intelligence policy addresses the sharing of information between the UN and its member states. Hence, it is meant to regulate the disclosure and release of sensitive information. Yet the reluctance of member states relative to peacekeeping intelligence stem from the lack of secure, clear, and standardized procedures in the UN peacekeeping intelligence sharing system. The lack of trust impeding peacekeeping intelligence sharing between substantive units stems from four challenges. Unclear tasking by senior leadership, overlapping of mandates of substantive units, and ensuring duplication of work, perception of insecure handling, storing, labeling of information, and competition between units. UN personnel interviewed complained that the senior leaders of the mission were not all equally aware of the role of each unit and ensued a lack of clear tasking of these entities. And senior, senior leaders themselves, while interviewed, admitted that if each unit had a key role in peacekeeping mission, their input in their own decision-making was neither clear nor consistent. This generated both overlap in the work of units, duplication of reports, and ultimately information overload for the leadership. As more reports are produced with, with less crucial or relevant information, the harder it is for the senior leadership to rely on the products delivered to them, hence limits the predictive and forecasting credibility of the delivered output. The resulting lack of trust in the information provided by the units limits the support to the decision-making process. Analysts also highlighted the frequent tension and competition between the peacekeeping intelligence units due notably to the blurriness of tasking and the ensuing overlap in the work divisions. Trust stems from predictability, yet in a UN context in which the peacekeeping intelligence policy is still new, sharing mechanisms are still not set. The lack of interpersonal trust remains a key challenge to effective peacekeeping intelligence for five key reasons. 
the lack of familiarity with the UN way of doing intelligence, the lack of intelligence expertise of the personnel, the political sensitivities linked to the posting and the hiring process, linguistic barriers within the organizations and with the locals, and finally on the capacity of the UN to react in a timely manner to the intelligence that is shared. The UN promotes diversity and representativeness, hence its recruitment system is meant to be neutral, impartial, and based on peace operations need. However, the difficulty of targeting candidates with intelligence experience highlights both general hurdles with the system, as well as hurdles more specific to peacekeeping intelligence. In addition to the lack of peacekeeping intelligence expertise, the selection of analysts to perform the task is a politicized process, which seems sometimes to prioritize informal national rapport with TCCs or member states over the peace operations need. When the units are systematically composed of a mix of pre-selected nationalities, informal holds of some member states on some posts also impact trust and sharing. Having key posts in peacekeeping intelligence by people who do not understand any of the local languages also entails communication problem. English is a working language of most missions operating in Francophone countries. And if English is the, <clears throat> the operational language for the force, many staff officers are unilingual Francophones. And in addition, French is the operational language for the police at the MINUSMA. The linguistic barriers between the mission and the locals and within the mission itself reinforces informal mechanism amongst individuals that speak the same language. Finally, the lack of trust relative to the timeliness of action also impact the intelligence that is shared between the locals and the mission. On the one hand, Sean Smith recently reported how Malian stakeholders do not wish to provide information to the mission for fear of reprisals, and the UN military were suspicious of information shared by the locals by fear of being lured into an ambush. In conclusion, a few years ago, UN intelligence was still mocked by some for being an oxymoron. Whereas intelligence remained a taboo until 2017, the UN peacekeeping intelligence policy is now being implemented convincingly enough in all peacekeeping missions that we can safely say that it is here to stay. The policy is being revised every two years and challenges remain for headquarters and missions to optimally align and to adapt its implementation for it to be relevant to each mission's context and constraints. It is still to be seen whether principles in lieu of a definition will hold. And then the, another key issue relates to both the opportunities and the drawbacks coming from the formalizing of practices. For now, the policy opens the way for improving each state of the intelligence cycle to better recruit, train, and retain personnel and overall improve sharing mechanism. Trust remains, however, to be earned for member states, units, and personnel for this new peacekeeping intelligence mindset to best assure the safety and security of their personnel and the protection of civilians. Thank you. Uh, merci beaucoup, Sarah Miriam, pour la, la présentation. Thank you so much for that presentation. I must say that one of the things that I, I really appreciated from it as a, someone who's a practitioner in the Canadian system is that some of the challenges that you identified within a multilateral UN context sound very familiar to me within a domestic uh, context. Um, you know, things such as comp uh, competition, uh, things such as sharing mechanisms. I think that those are some of the the universal questions that face our discipline, uh, regardless of where it's uh, where it's practiced. I also like the 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 issue how you frame the relationship between the UN and member states. For me, it was uh, analogous a little uh, toward um, in the way that uh, Daniel Jean spoke about uh, how Canada's community uh, should be uh, better in terms of working with uh, new partners and perhaps non-traditional uh, partners where trust still needs to be, uh, be built, partners such as businesses and other non-governmental organizations. And uh, in terms of that, uh, that segue also in, uh, to, the, to the national level, I think that that raises uh, um, our, our next uh, uh, panelists. And uh, I really would like to welcome um, colleagues Stephanie Carvin and Thomas Junot uh, to speak about, do we need to Canadianize uh, intelligence? Over to you, Stephanie. Um, so I will start, then I'll move on. I'll pass it on to Stephanie, and then I'll finish. That's the way we, we uh, set, uh, set this up. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Arthur. Thanks a lot to Justin and the organizers at UCAM. Um, so we are going to look at uh, this issue from the Canadian uh, angle. So as was discussed by uh, Monsieur Jean uh, over lunch and a couple others, Canada is a net recipient of foreign intelligence thanks to its many intelligence cooperation partnerships, the Five Eyes and uh, others. This brings massive benefits to Canada. 
at a limited cost, we have access to a massive pool of raw and finished foreign intelligence. But it also comes with a number of costs. Um, one of those is that large amounts of the raw and finished intelligence that Canada receives from allies and partners often reflects the priorities and the interests of these allies and partners, and not necessarily those of Canada. Sometimes yes, but sometimes no. So to mitigate the challenges posed by this heavy reliance on foreign intelligence shared by allies and partners, and with little or no prospect of the establishment of a foreign intelligence service, Canada's national security and intelligence community in recent years has taken steps to Canadianize um, its foreign intelligence collection and analysis. So in our, our chapter in this forthcoming book, uh, we uh, look at the context that has led to the emergence of this trend. We flesh out its content. We explain why, all things considered, it is a positive uh, development. So, Stephanie, over to you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Welcome to my parents' basement. Um, so, uh, in speaking uh, about our project, just for a little context, I mean, this is one slice of a much larger uh, project that looks at how the intelligence uh, assessment community in Canada interacts with the policy community and uh, how it might do better. So, our methodology was effectively that we looked at, we, we spoke with 68 individuals for our study, uh, of most of whom were Canadian, but 15% coming from Canadian allies, all of whom have a range of experience everything from uh, the deputy minister level all the way down to the uh, lowly desk analyst. And I can say that as a former lowly desk analyst. Um, we also spoke to, uh, you know, the people in our cohort of, of interviewees were policy consumers, um, you know, sorry, they were policy uh, uh, folk, they were consumers, they were producers, sometimes they'd served in, in multiple functions. And a lot of uh, our interviews actually also focused on the US, which is where we're kind of drawing a lot of, of this, the information for the presentation today from, we looked at media reports, we looked at the limited scholarship on it. And of course, we have been attending, uh, you know, conferences and events, some of the Chatham House rules to inform our study. The one thing uh, you should probably be aware of is we did guarantee anonymity to all of our other uh, people because many of them are still serving in the community and the community itself is small. And as a result of that, uh, you know, even where people said they could go on record, you know, if you say that you spoke to a former CSIS director, well, there's not very many of those. So it's not really that hard to figure out who they are. So we decided on a uniform anonymity for the purpose of our study. So our paper starts off with the Canadian context, right? Uh, most important being, as we've already mentioned throughout this conference, there is no Canadian CIA, no MI6. Um, but there is, you know, to say that there's an absence of foreign intelligence in Canada is also somewhat of a myth. Um, the CSE, for example, hi Arthur, um, you know, they, they have their part A uh, foreign espionage mandate. D&D &D collects a whole range of, of foreign intelligence, usually tied, almost, almost always tied to the D&D &D mandate, but they do do a lot of, um, you know, they write their own policy analysis as well on issues related to national security and defense. And they have the widest range of kinds of intelligence they can collect. They collect um, human, SIGINT, GEOINT, I think WeatherInt. Famously now they collect MEDINT apparently. Um, and we can have a whole discussion about that some other time. Um, CSIS is a bit of odd in the sense that, you know, it can collect collect domestic intelligence outside of Canada, but um, it has to be tied to a threat to Canada. It can collect foreign intelligence, but the foreign intelligence collection has to be within Canada. And I don't really want to get into that. If you have questions about that, happy to answer later. It's just very uh, odd state of affairs. Uh, uh, Global Affairs Canada, of course, has the GSRP program, It's but the individuals who do it are engaged in political reporting, not intelligence gathering. They are openly declared um, officers of the um, of, of you know diplomatic core, so there, there's no really clandestine nature there. But the reports that they write are actually often shared with uh, our allies as well. And of course, there's some a lot of uh, intelligence and analytical units that have access to foreign intelligence and use it in their uh, assessments for predominantly for domestic uh, clients, but sometimes those are shared as well. So I'm thinking here in terms of the Privy Council Office's uh, Intelligence Assessment Secretariat and the Integrated Terrorism Assessment Center, or ITAC. Um, in terms of our arrangements, you know, we said before, I won't beat this too much. Um, we are a consumer. Um, we do have, you know, there's the five eyes, which is, of course, our most important. But also we have, uh, you know, CSIS has declared in its most recent intelligence, sorry, a public report that it has 
300 agreements with 150 countries. Those agreements are based on a number of factors, including, you know, use of torture and reliability, and they must be approved by the Minister of Public Safety in consultation with the Minister uh, Ministry of Public Affairs. Um, CSE. Well, I don't know what's here. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we, don't, we don't really know. They don't declare how many uh, uh, arrangements they have, but uh, there have. I do have parliamentary testimony where um, a, a former chief said, yes, we have some stuff, but then moved on very quickly. Um, so as Thomas said, that, that basically forms the background. We do have a foreign intelligence. So to say like we're a complete desert is wrong. That said, no question about it, we are an intelligence consumer and or a net, you know, we, we consume more than we actually produce. And this has been, you know, uh, a lot of uh, intelligence, a lot of ink has been spilled about this issue. Um, so what are the costs and benefits of this? Well, Canada benefits because we uh, avoid a lot of negative externalities. Uh, we, we, the cost savings are enormous, right? We don't spend the money on it. We avoid certain risks uh, to, to our reputation. We're able to have, um, uh, as a result, you know, we, you know, we always look like the good guys. Oh, we don't do that kind of nasty uh, human foreign intelligence collection. So that helps. But there are a number of costs. Um, Canada's own interests and perspectives. You know, when, when we're so reliant on intelligence from for your allies, it's it's you know, certain perspectives can be lost. The information we are we receive is determined by outside interests. Um, in addition, we um, you know, we actually may need. Some of the intelligence is a discussion of who would actually read it. Well, the way the threats are evolving and the non-traditional partners that Arthur talked about in the uh, segue to the segment suggests that, you know, actually some of these clients need intelligence that may be more of foreign in nature than, uh, say, uh, security intelligence oriented. Uh, the priorities are different when you are uh, receiving intelligence from, you know, your partners all the time. They have priorities that don't necessarily reflect your own. And I think this is also really important that is sometimes lost, which is that, I think sometimes the intelligence assessments that are made and, and you know, or, or when, you know, kind of are being considered, it may actually reflect the capabilities of an organization. So, uh, for example, the United States may come to certain conclusions about trends in the Middle East because it has, you know, diplomatic leverage in that region, whereas, you know, Canada largely doesn't. So we may come to very different conclusions. So I think capabilities can actually influence the kind of information that we are receiving. Are we taking that into consideration? Um, we've already mentioned here the Trump factor. We can't always depend on the U.S. being there. You know, are we being too deferential to U.S. and and Five Eyes assessments? And are we actually doing enough of a job of shaping conversations around intelligence around a Five Eyes table? So, I mean, that's a lot there, and I'm going to stop talking because uh, we have about four minutes left. So, <laughs> uh, go ahead, Toma. So thanks for that. So given this reality of, of the costs associated with Canada's reliance on its intelligence partnerships, simplifying massively here the debate, two options uh, can, are, are proposed. The first one is, as was mentioned by Stephanie, by uh, Monsieur Jean over lunch, is the creation of a foreign human intelligence agency. Um, this has been a low level but ongoing debate for years or decades. Bottom line, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, I, I don't think it's likely to happen. So on that basis, as Stephanie and I were, were thinking about this, largely in the context of, of this broader project that we've been working on for a few years now, uh, in our discussions with people in the community, uh, we, we, we saw this nascent trend of what we call Canadianization of foreign intelligence. And here, it's, it's important to make a difference between describing an ongoing trend and describing something that we would like to happen or that other people would like to happen. So there's a descriptive dimension and a normative dimension here. Focusing first on the descriptive part. Um, so Canadianization of foreign intelligence has started. Uh, it's scattered. It is not the result of a coherent strategy drawn up by the center of the Canadian uh, intelligence community. It's more a number of small, some not so small developments that are happening uh, more or less in parallel uh, throughout uh, Ottawa. So just to take a step back, what do we mean by Canadianization? Uh, just to, to keep it short, it's a constellation of initiatives that aim to shift the collection and the analysis of foreign intelligence towards a, a clearer and stronger pursuit of properly Canadian interests, as opposed to receiving uh, raw and finished intelligence that may or may not reflect Canadian interests. So in practice, what does it look like? Uh, there's a lot of examples, as I said, uh, some nascent, some a bit more advanced, but not really connected. 
um, CSE and active cyber operations, um, CSIS's uh, uh, growing uh, operations abroad, uh, the GSRP program that Stephanie mentioned that has grown a lot in, in recent years, the creation of a small assessment unit in our foreign ministry next uh, to the GSRP uh, program. Um, until three years ago, Canada's foreign ministry did not even have an, an internal analytical or assessment unit, similar to what the US has as the INR. Um, the creation of a DG specifically for intelligence in foreign affairs. Uh, and these are th these may seem fairly small, but a bigger one uh, that, that we won't get into in detail, but is actually quite significant, is a better integration of the intelligence community's efforts to deal with uh, new and emerging threats like foreign electoral interference, uh, investments of concern by uh, uh, state-owned enterprises, mostly from China, in critical sectors like natural resources. Um, that has really led the intelligence community to learn to work very quickly with non-traditional partners. CSC, to take that example again, now works very closely with Elections Canada uh, to counter threats that are very specific to Canada. And this is something that was simply not happening until a few years ago. Um, because we're short on time, I will not get into detail on this. Uh, but the next step is to try to think about what else could be done uh, to, to, to encourage the continuation of this trend. Um, the governance aspect I didn't talk about, but there would be a lot to say. The governance of Canada's national security and intelligence community has strengthened a lot in recent years, but much more could be done. Uh, training, which is also a really interesting point that Daniel Jean mentioned that was raised in one of the questions. A lot more could be done at this level too, not only on the intelligence side in terms of how to make your analysts better uh, to, to, to support policy, but also on the policy side to, to improve the intelligence literacy uh, in the community of people in the Privy Council office and, and you know, are more or less our equivalent to the White House on the public service side in the foreign ministry, in policy shops uh, across Ottawa where uh, intelligence literacy is quite low. Um, so to finish, I'll just mention two last points uh, uh, to conclude. This trend towards uh, the Canadianization of foreign intelligence is new. Uh, it is nascent. It is still immature in many ways. It is not a conscious strategy, but it's there. Uh, if you connect these dots that are not necessarily connected in, in practice, uh, you, you can really see that trend. It has broad gains, we think, at a manageable cost. Uh, and and the most important of those gains is positioning the intelligence community to provide its customers with collection and analysis that is more tailored to uh, supporting uh, Canadian interests. And that on its own may sound like stating the obvious, but it's not. It's actually something that is quite hard and something that the Canadian intelligence community did not do very well until recently. And the second uh, consequence to mention, and I'll finish on this, is that it actually better positions Canada to be a positive and active contributor to its intelligence partnerships, the Five Eyes and others. In intelligence partnerships, information, whether it's raw intelligence or finished products, it's a currency. And the more you provide, the more you'll be taken, the more you give, the more you'll be taken seriously, and the more you can get back in exchange, because some of that is, is traded. So by being able to provide a more specifically Canadian contribution, it actually positions Canada to be taken more seriously in crude terms. And this again is a, a builds on a point that Daniel Jean made over lunch. It's not just the quality, the quantity of the information that you bring to the table, it's also the quality. And in this sense, it would mark uh, an, an improvement. And on this, I will uh, pass it back on to Arthur. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. I think a great presentation. Uh, really appreciated the uh, the emphasis on Canadianization and and how do we get there and how do we reflect those those national interests and those national priorities in our own system. But I guess that my my question and this is I'll, I'll throw that this question out to to all of you to start the conversation. Uh, again, before I turn to, to participants, I already see that we've got three questions uh, in the Q&A function, so I encourage others to, to, to uh, add to them. But again, on, on the concept of Canadianization, uh, it seems to run counter to the whole concept of intelligence sharing as an objective. Uh, and so, you know, all three presentations pointed out certain challenges uh, with international intelligence sharing. Trust among partners, uh, the centrality of national interests, divergence in, in intelligence priorities, level of risk tolerance, and whether or not it was at the UN, whether or not it was for Canada, whether it was around the transatlantic nature of our partnership, those sort of four broad baskets of, of divergence or of, of, of difference uh, seem to be affecting uh, our ability to have these kinds of partnerships. So, 
So my question, and I'll, I'll, I'll maybe I'll, I'll turn it into to the order of the individuals who spoke, is is multilateral cooperation in intelligence actually worth the effort? Um, what is at stake if we simply ruthlessly uh, pursue our own national interests and, and dedicate scarce resources uh, to focusing in on national level uh, intelligence priorities? Um, Adriana, can I start with you? Yes. Um, so that's an excellent question. Is multilateral, multilateral cooperation worth uh, the effort? Absolutely, it is worth the effort because this is the fourth industrial revolution that is rooted in information. And this, uh, this time calls for new thinking, for innovation. Uh, an unprecedented fusion of knowledge, cultures, practices, um, and planning. So from this perspective, I believe that uh, the threats, that uh, the global threats, uh, pandemics that know no, that know no borders, climate change, uh, these are um, issues, non-state invisible issues that affect everyone. So definitely working together to uh, share information because information or intelligence that is not used is useless. So why, why just have it just to have it? Uh, um, so there is, there is gain in sharing and creating, working to uh, reframe, reinvent, uh, how we share information. Thank you. Uh, interesting. I, I really like the, the the reference to some of those new new issues. Um, you know, on climate change, on uh, things like pandemics, on big data. I guess that's the question. Are, are, you know, and I'll, I'll turn it now to uh, to Sarah Miriam in terms of is it worth it? Are those are those and I'm using air quotes new issues the ones where we can actually focus our attention in terms of that multilateral action or are they or are they still more traditional things like again protecting our our, our, our soldiers or our peacekeepers or protecting uh, against uh, physical threats how do you see the the value added proposition in uh, in this multilateral sharing context so if I take your question, is it worth the effort? Um, given that in the UN context, the effort is made toward the safety and security of UN personnel, of course, and, and the protection of civilians at large, I think that any effort obviously is, is worth it. In the sense, um, the question of intelligence, uh, as, as you all know, intelligence is a tool to support decision making. And that that's what was lacking. The UN still didn't have perfect early warning system. Uh, uh, but there was a lack of visibility, of, of anticipation, of, of threats, of risk, and, um, and it's coming together uh, in order to, um, to be more efficient in, in, in protecting the civilians in general. So if it's worth it, obviously it is worth it. Now, how do you work when, uh, when it's all the member states in the world that are, um, that are seen as sharing secrets in a way? Um, I think that's where that's where uh, multilateralism is key, and the question of um, of added value of each member state is also important. No, it's not so much the, the quantity of inputs, but what can each member state contribute in terms of best practices. So the UN is being very careful, and in, in, as I said in the presentation, not to adopt one member state way of doing things. Or there were, uh, for example, negotiations in in practices saying whether the UN should approach NATO like methods or NATO-like approaches to intelligence. And there has been some resistance, as you might imagine, from some other member states that are not part of NATO uh, to adopt those approaches. So it depends. So which best practice to adopt um, to facilitate this, uh, this sharing of, of uh, quality input, but um, the effort to uh, hone practices in order to better uh, assure the protection of, of, uh, of the troops, of the civilians, and of the local population in general is obviously worth it. Uh, thank you, Sarah Miriam. Uh, over to, to you, Stephanie and, and Tama. Uh, I don't know, Stephanie, do you want to go ahead? 
Sure. Um, so one of the things that came out in our research is that, um, and not just our research, and, and again, I spoke, we've been to other forums and spoken to to wide variety of, of uh, domestic and international people itself. Um, I think people actually want more Canada. Like people want more of us. Like they, and, and, not, and by more, I, I don't think they just mean um, more intelligence. I mean, that was one thing that I found very interesting was that uh, I thought, maybe our allies would be like, oh no, Canada, you know, you're, you're not good at this. Like get out. Don't, don't let us kind of manage the foreign intelligence. No, they actually, our allies really want us to collect foreign intelligence and, and, and to contribute uh, as, as Tomas said, they actually want us to do more, but it's not just doing more in terms of collection. Um, one of the things uh, that, that really came out strongly in our interviews is we don't say very much when we go to these international forums, we don't contribute to the conversation. We're not helping shape the way that our allies see the information. So I, I think that, you know, when it comes to, you know, intelligence sharing and cooperation, it's not just about what you, it's not just about the actual tactical stuff that you bring, although like, let's be honest, that's what the Americans want. They want the tactical stuff, right? But um, I think it's also the fact that like, you know, you can help shape the way that our allies see things. You can help shape the way that we ourselves see things, but you, ha in order to do that, you actually have to have analysts that are trained to formulate opinion. You have to have a leadership that buys into that, that analysis and then brings it to the table and helps to shape those discussions. And so if we think about multilateralism in that context, yeah, I think there's a lot more that we could do. And I think that Canada, you know, it, it, when you said before, is, is Canadianization actually getting away from intelligence? sharing and cooperation. I actually think it's the opposite. I think if we did more for ourselves, we're going to do more for our allies, right? Like, you know, I, I don't, I, we shouldn't see this as a, a mutually exclusive thing. I don't know, Tamaz, did I get that right? Or am I fired? <laughs> no, no, I, I, that's, uh, I, I can't fire you. Um, I, th that's perfect in terms of, of, so that's, I think part of the answer that I would have said is exactly that, that uh, so that's that's great. The, the only other thing that I'd add to that is, is multilateralism worth it? Um, even in an ideal world where 10 years from now we hold part two of this conference and uh, we, we assess hypothetically that the best case scenario happened and that Canada succeeded uh, significantly in terms of Canadianizing its foreign intelligence efforts, um, even in that case, which I doubt will happen, uh, but even if that best case scenario happens in terms of what is realistically feasible, Canada will remain highly reliant on uh, its partnerships. We will still be a, a massive importer of foreign intelligence, chiefly through the Five Eyes in direct bilateral arrangements with the US and to a far lesser extent with a variety of, of other smaller arrangements, but chiefly through the Five Eyes in the US. Whatever we do, we will remain reliant is that a good thing? Yes, it is. Does it create vulnerabilities? Yes, it does. Does it create uh, 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 certain risks if, for example, Trump wins again in 2024 and the U.S. really takes a, a, a nasty direction after that? Yes, it does. Um, but even in those cases, we will remain, uh, you know, we'll remain a, a net importer. But one thing we say in the paper that I, that I didn't mention in the presentation is ultimately this is a happy problem. Uh, the, even though there are costs, there are vulnerabilities, um, this is a good position to be in. There are very few countries in the world, when they think about their intelligence posture and how to approach intelligence partnerships, have the luxury of looking at it from Canada's angle of being, despite the fact that we are facing increasing threats, we're still a very secure country, uh, and we're still really lucky that two of the top intelligence powers in the world, the US and the UK, you know, plus Australia and New Zealand, but to be to be blunt, chiefly the U.S. and the U.K., give us uh, massive amounts of intelligence. We're really lucky. So the the whole debate on Canadianization is about managing what is a happy problem, but still, it's worth asking: what can we do better? Thank you so much for that uh, for those answers to, uh, to all the panelists. Uh, uh, really appreciate it. Um, now, uh, I think we have now approximately seven questions, uh, not approximately, that's actually precisely seven questions in the, uh, in the chat. Um, a lot of them are Canadian related, but I think all of them have, uh, have uh, links uh, to uh, issues that have been raised by all the panelists. Um, the first one that I'll, that I'll, that I'll, I'll share uh, is something that also came up in the presentation from Danielle Jean, were the, the benefits of improving Canadian information sharing but a limitation frequently me uh, mentioned by various organizations such as CSC and CSIS is that, that we are prevented from sharing that information unless expressly authorized to do so. And I guess the question goes to 
the entire panel, uh, but maybe probably uh, first to Stephanie and, and Tama, is do you have any proposals that would permit our own intelligence agencies uh, to enable additional timely disclosures, especially with industry and academia? So Tama, if I can, I would just bump in and say, um, I think where the pandemic has accelerated that uh, without without any question. I actually think, uh, you know, not to just, you know, it's not just because you hear our tour, <laughs> but um, I think the CSE has done a really good job on this in terms of creating the cyber center, right? You have that agency that's kind of that halfway house between. One of the products that I think is really cool is that they, they're now using the traffic light system, uh, which I think you guys are the first, as far as I'm aware, to, to really kind of use that system, which has like a red, which is, please don't share, uh, yellow, you can share with trusted people in your organization, green, you can kind of share more broadly and white, hey, we're just putting on the internet. Um, having those kinds of more nuanced levels of being able to share products, I think is really, really important. Um, you know, I see, I know the CSE, they've created, uh, you know, they've been transforming their academic outreach unit into a stakeholder engagement unit, and they've been going out and doing these more specific talks. They're having, you know, is in is in the paper this week, the, the you know, one of the biggest clients right now is universities who are, are really kind of struggling with what do I do with all this, you know, Chinese born <laughs> money that we now have. Uh, so there's a lot going on. Um, I, I think that, you know, the circumstances, the kind of threats that we're dealing with are forcing the agencies to come out. The bigger question is, you know, authorities do, you know, it, the authorities to do this are not entirely clear. Uh, I think that we saw the CSIS director come out and basically say, you know, this is something that we need clarified by parliament. So one of the steps that I think needs to be taken is to make sure that the legal authority to share this information is actually there and on the right statutory footing. And hopefully we'll see that in the review of C-59, which will be coming up in the next uh, two years, I believe. Thank you, uh, Stephanie. I don't know if any, uh, Tama, did you want to uh, jump in on that as well? Yeah, just to add, uh, so the, the, the dimension of authorities uh, is, is hugely important. Stephanie touched on that. There are multiple other obstacles, though, beyond uh, authorities uh, to, to, to allow and then facilitate and encourage uh, that kind of information sharing with non-traditional partners elsewhere in the government. Think about working with a public agency, Health Agency of Canada, and this goes to any other country for that matter, uh, during the pandemic, um, beyond the issue of authorities. You know, different cultures. Uh, you can't just tell uh, somebody in an intelligence agency, go sit down with somebody in a socially or economically focused uh, line department and say, talk to each other and come up with a solution to this problem. That would be nice. In the real world, it doesn't work like that. You have different cultures, you have different information systems. Uh, the example I gave, you know, to counter foreign electoral interference when CSE had to start talking to Elections Canada a few years ago, when that became a big thing uh, in terms of foreign electoral interference. Um, managing the reality that CSC lived and worked in a highly classified information environment, whereas Elections Canada barely had anybody with security clearances. They did not have the computer systems and information systems and filing cabinets to store that information. They didn't have the culture to, to you know, in, incorporate these classified inputs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and beyond those details, which may be eye rolling for a lot of people, but they really matter in terms of getting these things done, is governance structures. Uh, you need deputy minister committees, you need cabinet committees, and then you need all the structures uh, going down the, the hierarchy to really make that cooperation happen. Today, uh, the Canadian public service uh, and at the political level is, is light years ahead of where it was 10 years ago in terms of facilitating these exchanges of information uh, to counter whether it's foreign investment, electoral interference, the pandemic, as Stephanie mentioned, there's still a lot of progress to, to make that we could spend a lot of time identifying ongoing problems, but it's really important to see this, this, um, this, this positive trend. And, and, you know, one of the legacies of the pandemic, I hope, uh, will be that new channels of communication of information sharing, especially between the health focus departments and the, and the community and the intelligence community, but also with academia, with private sector research, with pharmaceutical companies, which again, were relationships that either literally did not exist or barely existed 14 months ago, um, that I hope that beyond the pandemic, to some extent, uh, that they will be consolidated and continue. Uh, thank you, Tama. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, we have a, a number of other questions, and I'll sort of I would to like okay. to hey, Gina, I'd ahead. like to just uh, briefly add something here. Uh, completely uh, um, nice and uh, comprehensive answers. I would like to say that 
the future uh, in information collection, it's somebody said, does not belong to the collectors, but to those who use information strategically. Therefore, it makes sense for uh, CSC and uh, uh, CSIS to work and create special agreements uh, with, uh, uh, with academia or private sector, because the, the scope of the intelligence has broadened. The scope of the intelligence has broadened. So it's not anymore the Soviet Union or the terrorists. We have business intelligence, technological intelligence, climate change intelligence, food intelligence, water intelligence, and, and, and everything else that uh, has to do with that. So, but the problem that I want to mention here is the fact that who will monitor this uh, uh, partnerships and uh, who will they be accountable to? So I will leave it here. I think that that's a, a, a great question. I actually want to come back to that at the uh, at the end because it, it ties back to one of the questions that Jill Sinclair asked about uh, accountability and uh, and whether or not we have the right systems in place. But I do want to get to the the list of questions from our from our, our participants. And maybe uh, Adriana, I could turn this one to you as well. Um, uh, Thomas uh, uh, Brancato asked about a dependency or reliance on foreign intelligence. Uh, as a, something that implies dependency, does it imply dependency? And I think in your presentation, you did speak about sort of the the, the dominant player in 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 the, in, the, in the in the sphere in terms of transatlantic intelligence uh, uh, relations. Um, though the question might be specific to Canada, I think it applies in the European context also. Is this situation ever detrimental uh, to the uh, consumers' needs and wants? That's an excellent question. Uh, yes, dependency can be good uh, if you do not have the resources necessary. So you take the time to accommodate and uh, provide for what you need. But dependency of anything, uh, it's not really good. Uh, in the case of Canada, uh, Canada has many partnerships and receives intelligence according to its needs. In the case of the European Union, as I found in my research, uh, the underinvestment in technology and technological infrastructure to, to share uh, information and underinvestment uh, uh, in uh, uh, data analysis and knowing uh, your, your secrets and knowing your threats and uh, uh, it can be detrimental. Thank you. Uh, next question is from uh, Jean-Noël Berube. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll direct this question to, to Sarah Miriam. Uh, he makes reference to uh, an article in, in, uh, in the Canadian uh, newspaper or a Canadian journal uh, about the number of Canadian peacekeepers deployed around uh, abroad hits a 60 year low. Canada had then only 25 armed forces members in the field at the end of April 2020 in Mali, South Sudan, uh, the DRC, Cyprus, and the Middle East, as well as 10 police officers in Mali. So the question from, uh, from him is, can we do better in 2021 to improve our Canadian peacekeeping intelligence cooperation and presence in the field? I think we can do better, whether it's 2021 or 2022 or 2023, I'm not sure. Um, I guess the news with the uh, new Collège Militaire Saint-Jean uh, and the Francophone um, uh, becoming the Francophone equivalent to Kingston is a, is, a good, um, is a good news with regards to training a new generation of what hopefully could become peacekeepers. Um, in terms of intelligence itself, uh, of course we have, um, we have a, smaller, uh, a smaller army than, than, than other uh, than other states, um, so we cannot provide as many troops as, as other states can. But I think to come back to what we can provide and the added value, that, that should be maybe more the focus. Uh, Canada did not contribute many troops in Mali, however, they did contribute uh, significant logistic uh, support, not long enough, but still. Um, we also have the added value of providing highly professional trained personnel to missions that are often bilingual. So that question of linguistic barrier is also um, something in which Canada has an added value. And as Daniel Jean was mentioning, we also come with less baggage than other states. 
So we're not seen as a superpower. We're not a former colonizer. So we have sometimes better, a better, um, better reputation once we are um, in the field. So if we can do better, certainly. I think we still need more training in terms of UN-wise, especially. Most of our, our troops uh, have been deployed in a NATO context. And unfortunately, I think there's not enough training on, on what is the UN, what is the purpose of the UN, and uh, what is distinct about the UN versus the NATO. And I think it can be quite a frustrating experience for, uh, for soldiers who are deployed in peacekeeping missions to see how seemingly disorganized a peacekeeping mission is. Because of course, it's, it's composed of different nationalities with different training, different methods. And, uh, and I think it can be quite shocking for, for military to arrive in such, a, in, in such a multinational context. But that's also, uh, although it's uh, the UN mess, it's a beautiful mess as well uh, to be able to, uh, to, uh, to work with so many countries and, and, and to find a way to, um, to find solutions to common threats and objectives. So that's my long answer. But yes, we can do better. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Saran Yoyam. I, I, I love the beautiful mess analogy as well, too. Uh, I think that should be a, a good name for a new band. It's not quite the Rolling Stones, but it's pretty good. Um, uh, next question is from uh, Jean-Pierre Ch Chabot. Uh, and the question is, if further sharing between the intelligence community and private or nonprofit sectors is desirable, then should trust be started to be built by a sharing context and inviting private and nonprofit entities to shift their work towards the context priorities identified and shared by the intelligence community. Uh, so again, it's the nature of the relationship between uh, the intelligence community and more non-traditional partners. I don't know if um, to start off, maybe I can ask uh, Thomas if you wanted to take that one. Uh, I think that is a, a very important question. And the issue of trust is, is hugely important. Uh, it goes uh, in, in multiple directions. The one that, that was mentioned in the question in terms of, of trust between the intelligence community and these new uh, actors with which it collaborates in the private sector, in civil society, in biz uh, with businesses, universities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and when I look at that, for me, the key point is that too often that, uh, two parts to my, to my argument here. A, too often that trust is lacking uh, and B, the reality that that trust is lacking hurts national security. Um, when actors in civil society, in universities, right, I've had informal conversations with people in the intelligence community who had these first meetings with universities trying to warn them of threats, uh, and um, the reception, uh, and this is an understatement, was not always polite. Uh, and the same goes for uh, the development of such relations uh, with uh, businesses uh, and civil society, and even elsewhere in the federal government, for that matter, where suspicion of the intentions of the capabilities of the hidden agenda, et cetera, et cetera, of the intelligence community, that remains very high. And it's not just in civil society, it's everywhere, including in, in, a, a, you know, in a fairly advanced and successful democracy like Canada. And the problem is that that trust deficit is a problem because it hurts the ability of the intelligence community to do its job by sharing information, by warning, by helping those who are under threat. Um, that's especially true when you look at you know, minority communities, et cetera, uh, but it's true across the board. Uh, and I think the onus is on the intelligence community to work to improve that trust deficit. As an organ, you know, uh, Arthur is here, so so let's be nice to him. CSC has done extraordinary work in the last few years to try to, uh, to 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 uh, uh, what's the word in English I'm looking for to 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 cut that. That's not the perfect word, but to reduce that trust deficit. Uh, CSIS, uh, the RCMP, uh, CBSA, which is our Border Services Agency, they they've improved, but they still have a lot of work to do at this level. And you know, I'll, I'll finish on this. But the key point is that that trust deficit it, it hurts national security, and the onus has to be on the agencies themselves uh, to reduce that trust deficit. Uh, thank you, Tama. I don't know uh, if anyone else wants to jump in in hot pursuit or to add to that. No? I will okay. contribute. Ditto. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it is important, right? I mean, the more we we engage, and I think it is a strategic objective of ours to be more engaged in, in with those non traditional actors. And uh, um, I'll take the shout out. Um, on the, the next question, um, 
uh, maybe again, I'll, I'll focus this one into Sarah Miriam, uh, was with regards to, uh, to multilateralism. Um, the question is, if we can do targeted sanctions, why can't we do targeted multilateralism rather than to continue to try to do multilateralism writ large? Do you think that those two concepts are incom uh, incompatible, targeted multilateralism versus broader multilateralism? And that's from Carlton Hughes. Um, thank you for the question. Targeted, that's a, that's a good concept, targeted multilateralism. I, I guess this is exactly what the UN is about, right? And, and, and some, you're, you're, you're finding collective, uh, collective solution to common problem um, that, are, uh, that are very specific. I think what we could, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the question well, if I, I have the right angle that you would like me to have, but um, if I look at UN missions, um, maybe something that could be better targeted is the added value of each member state that contribute to a specific mission. So for example, um, if you have Scandinavian countries uh, within a specific missions, maybe they have a specific added value intelligence wise that they can contribute and that you can maximize. I think this is already being, well, not only I think, but it is already being done uh, but maybe there would be a way to be more um, open transparent about it that uh, some some member states are chosen because of their added value including intelligence wise that you could deploy them to certain places so they could they could put to use their um, their specific um, knowledge that they that they develop so that might be a way to do more targeted multilateralism in which um, yeah, member states are, are picked and chosen uh, not only for political purposes, but for logistics and operational added value. Uh, thank you, uh, Sarah Miriam. Uh, Adriana, is there something that from a European context that also is in terms of targeted multilateralism? Are there sub-regional efforts in this space uh, that should be prioritized or could be prioritized uh, from an effectiveness point of view in terms of intelligence sharing? Well, in Europe, is um, the situation is very complicated. Uh, absolutely, uh, multilateralism uh, is desirable. Um, Europe, in my view, um, works too separately. So already has many examples of multilateralism. Um, in intelligence sharing, probably we'll need to have something more cohesive uh, before we'll uh, um, engage uh, the European interest, national, transnational interest needs to be decide what is, uh, and then uh, uh, work to support that. So I'm not sure if I answered your question. Well, um I'll, I'll take it. I think that's a good, good response. Thank, thank you very much. Um, the next couple of questions, uh, I think I'll, I'll merge together. It's around uh, in, intelligence studies and intelligence education, the role of Canadian universities uh, in developing intelligence capabilities in terms of fresh recruits. Uh, I'll just sort of put on the, on, on the table here that I'm a, I've got my master's degree in security and intelligence studies from the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs here at, at Carleton. So it, there is some training and, and that goes back many, many, uh, many years. Um, but I, I guess, I, you know, to turn to all of you in terms of um, how does one structure uh, education and post-secondary education in this, in this context? What roles can universities play in, in uh, developing the skill sets, the competencies, the knowledge uh, that is required to foster uh, better uh, interest-based uh, intelligence relations uh, between our, our, our countries. Um, uh, not to show too much preference here, but she gave a shout out to me. So I'll turn to the, uh, to the Nipsia prof first maybe and go to Thank Stephanie. You. I know, Jim, I'm looking at this question of Jim, like, Jim, I teach on the Intelligence Studies MA. I mean, I'm literally, uh, it, like next week, it's starting up my Intelligence and Foreign Interference class. Literally, I, I, we're there. Um, I think, but like, just to be clear, I think we have to kind of balance this out. Yeah, I think we do have a need for more intelligence studies. I think the first thing I would say is, um, I think there's actually something of a renaissance right now in Canadian intelligence studies. I look at all the books coming out. There's been so many books coming out um, on on different, uh, you know, whether it's violent extremism, um, economic stuff. Uh, there's a big project right now going on at CG led by uh, Wesley Wark and Aaron Scholl. Like there's a ton of stuff happening 
working right now. So I think that's, I think this idea that academia is no longer interested in intelligence studies is actually wrong. And I don't think it's necessarily cheerling. Some of it's critical, some of it's uh, not. Uh, there's been surveillance studies for a very long time. There is a kind of like, but I would say in the last two, three years and looking forward to all the books coming out, there's a real renaissance in Canadian intelligence studies. This is this is a good thing. The second thing, however, though, is like when we did, so we did interviews and a big focus of the book that Tama and I have associated with the project that we're presenting the paper on, we spend a lot of time looking at the training issue. I'm not sure if what we need is intelligence studies programs in academia. I mean, I think we need some, but I think, you know, based on the feedback we have is, you know, the demand is really on skills, knowledge about around data, like people who com can combine like kind of the insights of the social sciences and know how to work with big data and, and those kinds of things. I think th these are going to be the kind of skills that um, the, the security studies uh, and, and intelligence studies or intelligence units are going to want their employees to have. So I think like what you really need are like, you know, teaching people how to work with statistics, big data, large amounts of information, uh, teaching people to write clearly uh, structured uh, analysis and those kinds of things. But then I think that what we actually need is more centralized intelligence education professionally within Canada. And I know at PCO, they've been um, re revamping that their intelligence uh, education, the uh, ILAP, I think it's called, or I, I'm forgetting the acronym, uh, to my you have to correct me after. Um, I, uh, that, ILP that that program has suffered a lot because no one wanted it. It was like a, a stepchild. Um, but there's been renewed investment in that program. Uh, Daniel Jean is now teaching on an intelligence program for executives, um, which is really important because one of the key problems we have is that a lot of times you have people who uh, in the government have a background in agriculture or have a background at all or have never worked in intelligence or health or health policy and all of a sudden they find themselves working in intelligence and we don't train them right so i think that's actually where the disconnect is in a lot of these cases it's like people who have degrees they've worked in other areas and all of a sudden they're put in the intelligence security community and it's great because they can bring their policy experience to intelligence but they don't necessarily you know they have to we, there's nothing there to facilitate their education they're learning they have to learn as they go and it's, it's it's a bit of a gauntlet so i'm talking a lot sorry no no it's okay but can i i was just wondering if i could before i turn it over to others to sort of do a bit of a hot pursuit on that um is how it relates quite frankly to the concept of intelligence sharing right so my back my degree is in international relations i was a, a diplomat for for a number of years uh and our my my, my good friend uh, david vigno often talks about you know intelligence diplomacy is yeah. there something in the in the in the academic uh, world uh, around international relations, where you think there should be a greater emphasis on on the practice uh, or understanding how intelligence sharing, how intelligence um, uh, cooperation uh, can evolve through the practice of, of diplomacy and international relations. I, I hope so. And I'm going to plug our other program, which is we. <laughs> Diplomacy studies uh, masters at Nipsia now as well. So uh, you know you can you can come to Nipsia and do a joint intelligence studies and di dip dip diplomatic studies. But actually, that was one thing that we found that we were missing is like you know I think in recent years Nipsia has felt that it has actually been teaching a lot about security, but not actually about how the actual practice of diplomacy works. So it's something that that we've been building. This has been a big uh, Nipsia plug. I can I can almost feel like Tomas like, glaring eyes because he's going to want to promote Nipsia. <laughs> well, why don't we open um, it up? But yeah. Some of the others. Yeah, to see. Anyway, uh, uh, Tama, before I turn to you, maybe I can ask uh, Sarah, Miriam, and uh, Adriana if they've got anything that they'd like to share in, from an educational and pedagogic point of view. Well, so, something that's missing for, for the UN necessarily, right, since it's a new policy, the UN peacekeeping intelligence, is that there's not enough experts on intelligence that are um that are going to UN missions and they're not attracted necessarily if you're a you if you're an expert in intelligence you don't necessarily go work for the UN and those who are coming to work for the UN can be experts in intelligence but certainly not experts um in the United Nations nor in in peacekeeping um uh, at all and the other mindset is that when you are trained of being intelligence you are trained of doing the right way Right. And the right way being the reference being your your how you're trained nationally. And, and that becomes um, complex when you are um, deployed or assigned to a multilateral setting in which many people do the right way, but in their own way. 
uh, so maybe there, there, there's maybe this multicultural, the diversity in intelligence would certainly be um, something to invest more. Uh, intelligence diversity, I think there, there, there's a need there. I, I know it's, it's being um, uh, given as lessons some in some places, but humility and diversity is what is needed as well in, in many intelligence realm, as in other academics realm as well. Uh, uh, here, I'll make a pitch for CSE. I mean, part of my role is as the senior official responsible for employment equity, diversity, and inclusion. It's increasingly part of, of, of our operational imperative is diversity uh, and how it's integrated, not only as, a, as an ethical question, but as a, as a mission imperative to be effective in pursuing our, our objectives. Um, Adriana, over, over to you. Okay, in my view, the current environment, threats, and interests should dictate actually um, what we train. There should be some uh, training on the uh, history of intelligence, uh, structural analytic, analytic techniques. However, I believe that we need more experts um, on, on China, we need experts in geography, we need historians, anthropologists, uh, experts in economics, financials, technology, experts on greed, um, water, um, nuclear proliferation. So, so we, we, we have to leverage technology and um, see what the artificial intelligence can offer and uh, and then uh, uh, train people with a broader perspective to understand the world and be able to identify a problem because teaching only about uh, this is how you um, use uh, the structural analytic techniques to demonstrate whether or not uh, somebody poisoned somebody uh, may not be sufficient in the uh, race competition that we are. Thank, uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I guess I have uh, one, uh, one last question. We have about uh, eight That's minutes good. left. Now, I wanna bring it back to, uh, uh, to the question that, uh, that Jill raised uh, in the earlier panel, which was around accountability and how challenging that can be. Uh, and one of the conversations that we often have is how um, you know, maintaining that accountability, maintaining uh, legitimacy at the national level is particularly challenging. My question is, can, can we actually have effective uh, accountability for intelligence at a multilateral level? Uh, it's often challenging in terms of the systems at national level. How, with the exception of the, of the instrument that they talked about in that first panel around just sort of sharing information about oversight and review, is there a way to pool accountability to make international intelligence share sharing in the context of, uh, of the UN, in the context of, of transatlantic relationships, or as we're building our own Canadianized approach to this question, is there a way to pool accountability effectively in a way that maintains credibility? Um, maybe I could start with, uh, with you, Sarah Miriam. This is a, certainly a question that is um, that it was high priority at the UN, and um, and it comes um, with formalizing practices that were more informal before, and that's one of the drawback of, of formalizing practices because when you have um, a standardized way of doing things, then of course you are accountable. And I'm thinking about the new um, human in, in the, the new human policy, if you will, at the United Nations, which is called um, acquisition from human sources that um, specifies the way to acquire information from human sources in a way that, for example, you are not to pay um, any of your, uh, you're, you're not to pay in any way um, any of your sources. Uh, you cannot approach children, of course, but that's 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 good practices. But in a context um, in which uh, people are lacking a lot of resources, not being able to pay or to compensate a source can be quite difficult. 
um, in the field. And this is, for example, one of the uh, one of the policy that has been decided at the UN headquarters that is harder to implement from from a missions perspective. So, and that was done. This policy, this new guideline of acquiring information from UN sources, was done in with having in mind greater accountability from the missions part. But with formalizing that practices, that actually put hurdle in gaining more information. So that's one part of it, formalizing practices in order to have higher accountability, but that has a direct effect on the quality of information that you can gather. And, and, and the second issue, I guess, for the UN is when you know you're supposed to act, especially in, in a UN situation and the peacekeeping situation, if you know that there is a risk or there is a threat to the mission or to the civilians, you need to act. So how do you... Um, uh, how do you mobilize the sufficient resources to act in a timely manner uh, once you know? And, and, and because once you know, you become accountable to acting. And, and that, that is a great challenge at the UN as well for, for the senior leadership to know in time and once you know to act in a timely manner. Thank you. Uh, Tama or Stephanie, is there anything that you wanted to add in terms of effective multilateral accountability for intelligence? Um, very briefly, I just want like to, to say on the previous question that uh, in, in 20 seconds, on the issue of graduate programs in Canada to do intelligence studies, I don't think it's a good idea, to be blunt. Uh, we're too small a country and uh, we can't really sustain it. And anyways, by and large, if you ask managers in the intelligence community what they want, with the exception of obviously specialized positions with you know, engineers and so on, but they learn that elsewhere, they want critical thinkers, they want good writers, they want all these generalist skills uh, that, that you can learn in other programs. And they also want diversity. They don't only want public and or poli sci or you know, just the Anipsia uh, uh, graduates. They want, as Adriana said, anthropologists, et cetera, et cetera. On this issue, uh, I just mentioned a, a brief point. Um, one of the challenges uh, that comes from, from intelligence cooperation partnerships when it comes to review and oversight and accountability is the specific angle of transparency. Um, because when some, when in a country like Canada, a lot of the information that the intelligence community has is imported from allies and is received, especially from the US and to a lesser extent others in the Five Eyes, we don't own that information. It is the various extents originator controlled. So to, to declassify that information, to be transparent about uh, the information that is owned uh, once it is received uh, in, on the Canadians, that is very difficult. Uh, it raises a whole bunch of complications. Um, and when, you know, for example, the US publishes a worldwide threat assessment every year, uh, we don't do that. And when you talk to Canadian intelligence officials uh, informally, some of them say, oh, that would be so hard because so much of the information we have, we, it doesn't come from us. I think some of that is partly true. I also think that it is a convenient excuse not to be transparent. You know, there can easily be a bit of both. Um, but even if it is a, a, a reality that is manipulated not to be transparent, to be blunt, there is a fundamental problem in how to be uh, overseen, how to be transparent when so much of the information comes from others and you cannot take the decision, or at least you're constrained in, in your ability to decide whether to release it or not, or to declassify it. Thanks, Tama. Ad Adriana, uh, I guess the last word on, on this matter to you. Okay, so in order um, to have effective accountability at the multilateral level, we need to have, uh, we need uh, experts to be able to monitor uh, things that go on that are going on. So uh, uh, there is a need of infrastructure and uh, uh, of experts. Uh, for example, accountability in the U.S. Congress, uh, supervising the U.S. intelligence community versus European Parliament, uh, the expertise that U.S. Congress has versus uh, the expertise that the uh, European Parliament uh, has. So going back to um, expertise is, is needed in order to ensure uh, that you provide proper accountability and oversight. Thank you. And, and thank you to everyone for, uh, for, for participating in this panel. Um, there was one last question in the, uh, in the, that, I, that, I'll, that I'll flag in the, uh, in, in the, in the chat. Uh, around uh, the questions of diversification and inclusion 
and uh, comparing us uh, in North America, perhaps to other other intelligence agencies. All, all I'll say, if I'll, I'll take that that question, just in terms of my uh, day to day work. Uh, Conversations about diversity and inclusion are absolutely central to the Five Eyes uh, partnership. It's something that we talk about on a, on a regular basis. Again, not only as a as a function of ethics or values, but as a function of operations. And how we define diversity and inclusion is everything from language to culture, but also to disciplines. I think Adriana, some of the things that you talked about uh, around making sure that we have everything from historians through anthropologists through economists, um, having people of various uh, you know diverse backgrounds actually facilitates, in my opinion, the intelligence sharing because there's a level of effectiveness and competence that one gets by having that kind of cultural diversity within an organization to, to communicate and build linkages and build trust uh, that are absolutely essential in, uh, in uh, effective intelligence sharing. So uh, I took that last, uh, last uh, opportunity to editorialize myself. So apologies for, uh, for doing that, but uh, I, I couldn't help myself. Uh, thank you, uh, Adriana. Thank you, Sarah Miriam. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, Tama. Uh, Justin, I turn the floor back to you. Thank you very much, everyone, for this uh, excellent session. Thank you, everyone. Uh, excellent uh, session as well. Uh, from my uh, point of view, you uh, outlined how much uh, challenges there are in uh, intelligence sharing, but much more uh, beyond this.